I will start by explaining uh, what a conditional probability is, and then eventually talk about Bayesian theorem. And then uh, after this, uh, we'll talk about naive Bayesian. Okay? Uh, so, first of all, uh, let me let me start with the question. Um, what's uh, what's the probability of coin flip equals heads, and then throwing a die gives you four. So you you do two things at once. You you throw a coin and then you throw a die. Right? How do you get this? Very simple question, right? Probability that let's call x1 the coin flip, this being heads, and x2 the die, and then this being four. What is this equal to? Hmm? Uh, for the head, one over two. Okay, so this is one over two, right? And this would be um, one over six. It's a, uh, using a regular die, six-faced one, okay? Uh, then what's the probability of these two happening at the same time? What do you do? Well, one over two times one over six. Right, it's one over two times one over six. In other words, you say probability of x1 being heads times probability of x2 being 4. That's not how you get it, right? So it's 1 out of 12. The answer is 1 out of 12. Uh, in other words, uh, by the way, here, uh, I want to say this and this happens. So this is one way to say it. And sometimes you might just say x1 equals to h and x2 equals to 4. This thing can be written like this. Or sometimes they might, you might even say x1 equals to h intersect x2 equals to 4. That, now this, this way of thinking is like, uh, think of all the events of flipping a coin and flipping a die. Well, let's see. Uh, here's a coin flip heads or tails, but then you can also have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So you could have like heads with one, heads with two, all the way to heads with six. Then here, what goes here? Tail with one, tail with two, and then tail to six, right? And then, uh, so these are what's called the sample space, right? And in this sample space, we're looking for this one case when you have four with heads. So there's this one case here. And of course, this is one out of two times six. So there are 12 possibilities. It's one out of the 12, right? But then uh, what, what th the way, way I'm thinking of this notation is that when x1 is h, that means uh, this first one is like all of these cases. Okay. This one is, I'm thinking of this as x1 equals to h. Right? The, these are all the cases where x1 is h. Is that right? Then what is uh, x2 equals to 4? Can you imagine what this set is? What is the set of x2 equals to 4? Is this, this, this set right here. This would be x2 equals to 4. Right? So uh, when you say two things ha happen at the same time, you can also think of them as intersections. That's why I'm using intersections. Is that okay? So there, there are two ways to talk about two things happening at the same time. Uh, ha having and, you could just say, I need, I need both of them, like a requirement as a comma. You could put and to stress the fact that I need both of them. Or you can also use the intersection. Okay? So this will be... Uh, some kind of a notational choice that I will go back and forth. Hopefully, it's not going to confuse you when I use these different notations. 
All right. Uh, so what I just demonstrated uh, with this problem is the pro property of, uh, or, or it's a rule of multiplication. Okay. How do you calculate two things happening at the same time? If you want both of them to happen, the probability would be you multiply the two. That's how you get the probability. Um, however, it's not as simple as that in general. So uh, let me talk about the second question. This time, let's say there's a there's a cup has uh, four jelly beans. And uh, two red, two blue. Okay. If I take out two jelly beans one by one, and just to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to take out one jelly bean. I'm not going to put it back, okay? Uh, but then I'm going to take another one out, right? So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, two jelly one by one without re replacement. And w what I mean by that is uh, I'm not putting the, the first jelly bean back. It, it'll be... Different, okay. Uh, what is the probability? Probability that first one is red and second is blue. Okay. Fair question. You could ask for such a probability, right? So, let me ask what the probability of the first one being red. What's that? One over four. Okay. Now, what's the probability of second one being blue? Two over four. Is it two oh, over four two or? I'm oh, sorry, sorry, this should be two over four. What am I saying? Two over four. This is two over four. And then the second one being blue would be two over three. Two over three. Why? Because we're doing without replacement, so one of the red bean is gone. A red jelly bean is gone, right? And you have one red and two blue. So now the probability is two thirds. Okay. Uh, now it, there's a problem here uh, because if you didn't know. If you didn't know that x1, uh, x1 was red, and if you just asked for probability of x2 being blue, not knowing what was chosen in the first one, okay? So it could be, uh, I, it could have been red or it could have been blue, then if you just asked for this, this is still one half. Okay, because if the first one was chosen as red, it will be two-thirds. But if the second, first one was chosen as blue, then it will be one-third. So very roughly, this is not a proper way to say it, but uh, it could be either two-thirds or one-third, but it's half and a half probability, right? So it must be that uh, uh, the mean value of two-thirds and one-third, if you have two-thirds plus one-third and you divide <coughs> it by two, it, it gives you one-half. Because this, this gives you one, right? Yeah. So this is one half. So uh, that that tells us that we need a different way of denoting this two out of three. So the correct way to say this, uh, the correct correct way to say what we just said is that the probability that x two is blue if x one is red 
is two-thirds. Two -thirds. Okay. And then only after this you can say that the probability of x1 being red and uh, com comma x2 being blue is equal to this times this other one. Okay. You see, if the first one was chosen as red, which is 2 fourths, and the second one is chosen as, so let's see, let me put a quote here, quote there, so it doesn't look weird. So I need to multiply this with that. Okay. So that uh, overall it would be, uh, sorry, why did I put Okay, so uh, I have to multiply this with that. So it will be 4 over 12, which is 1 third in total. Okay, so the answer is 1 third. Is that okay? Yeah. So, give me a moment. Uh, okay, I need to get my ink, so I'll be right back. Two minutes, two minutes. Not even two minutes, one minute. Oh, no, no, I had it. Okay. That was quick. That was quick. That was less than... I get really annoyed when marker doesn't work well. Okay, are, are you okay with this so far? Yeah. So, uh, let's try to compare these two things and, and see what's the main difference. See, in the first question, getting a heads or tail in the the first coin doesn't affect the throwing of the dice. It doesn't, I mean, this doesn't affect it at all, right? So that's why uh, we can just simply multiply them. If this is what happens, we say that these two events, so the correct way to describe is that in this case is when we say x1, x2 are independent events. But here, something's different. If you have red in the first draw, that would make it more probable that the second one is blue. If you have uh, blue in the first draw, then you'll have less probability that the second one is red. Is that okay? All right. So, so uh, here's, here's the modified is the modified formula for product rule. So, uh, rule of product. If you want probability of A and B happening at the same time, let's say two things, I want two things to happen at the same time. Then, uh, you compute it by saying probability A times probability uh, B, but under the condition of A. Is that okay? That's a general formula. That's a general formula. But what happens if B is independent of A? What happens? If B is independent of A, that means P of B, whether A happened or not, it's going to be the same as probability of B. Do you agree? Yeah, right? Yeah. So, So, in, in, so if A, B are independent, we have 
P of A and B happening at the same time, you simply have to multiply these two. So this is how you understand the conditional probability, okay? This conditional probability uh, is a way to uh, express the fact that if some, sometimes when an event happens, well actually uh, many times, there are many cases where an event happens, it will change the probability of the second event. So that's why there's some, some conditional probability. Now mathematically, if you ask what is a conditional probability, then rather than starting with an example, you just take this one as the definition of the conditional probability. So I, I wrote this down as if this is a mathematical formula, but actually this is a definition for PB of A. So uh, from here we see that we see that the probability of B under A, if you solve this by dividing by PA, is PA B A and B over P of A. So rule of the product is that we have uh, probability of uh, we actually have a definition rather than the product, uh, rule of product. Uh, the definition of a conditional probability is you think about the probability that both can happen, uh, both that are happening at the same time, and uh, or divided by the probability of A happening. Right. So that's the definition. Okay, so I've managed to explain what conditional probability is. Now let me talk about the Bayes theorem. Uh, oh, but before we do that, there's an accompanying rule that uh, uh, rule of addition. So uh, this this is if uh, you want probability of A or ha B happening, and this is computed by P of A plus P of B minus P of A intersection B. And since uh, just having the formula is not very uh, illustrative, let's talk about something like uh, uh, a school has uh, 50 boys, okay. then uh, 10 play basketball, and 15, let's say 20, 20 play football. So there, there, 10 of them are in the school basketball team and 20 of them are in the school football team and five uh, play both. Among them, five play both. Let's put a parenthesis. Okay, so 10 play basketball and 20 play football. There's like five people who overlap. Five people play both. Okay. So in this case, let's say this is A and this is B. And the question is, uh, if a random boy is picked, what is the probability? of A or B. What's the probability that this this kid is playing basketball or football? Now, uh, you could solve this without using this this formula because, well, 10 plus 20 is 30, but then 
five, five players are double counted, so you have to subtract five from it. So there are 25 people who play either of the sports, right? So what's the probability? Twenty-five out of how many? Fifty. Yeah. So what's the probability? One half. One half. Right? So probability is one half. That's how you can answer. Or you can use this formula and say this should be probability of A is ten out of fifty, and then probability of B is twenty out of fifty minus probability of A and B is five out of fifty. And you get the same answer, 25 out of 50. Is that okay? okay. So that, that's the rule of addition. Now what confuses a lot of people is that uh, if A and B is... If A and B has no overlaps, so this zero with the bar striking it, uh, this, this one is called the null set. Okay, so if A and B doesn't share anything, we say that uh, A, B are mutually what I say exclusive. Exclusive, right? Exclusive. Uh, but uh, see, mutually exclusive and independent sound like very similar things in English, so you kind of uh, get confused, but uh, if you have a non-zero probability, if a events A and B are non-zero non events, then being independent would have probability of PA intersection B as a non-zero non value, because you're multiplying these two. Right? Whereas, if you have mutually exclusive case, then the probability of A and B happening at the same time will be zero because uh, it, it never happens. I mean, this will be the case if uh, no players <coughs> play both. Maybe the school has a policy that you can't be on two, two teams at once. So there's no players that, that playing in both. In that case, you will have the two events to be mutually exclusive. Right? So. Uh, these these are very different things. Being mutually exclusive and uh, being independent are very different things. And I just want to say that I don't have space to write it, but it's kind of simple. If two events are mutually exclusive, the addition rule is very simple. If, if you want to know the probability of A or B happening, you just add the probability. Okay? So if you have a mutual exclusive events, then uh, probably of A or B happening is to simply add. That's the addition rule. And if you have two, e two events that are independent, you just simply multiply. You get the probability. Right. Okay. All right, so uh, with that, now I'm ready to explain the Bayes theorem. To that uh, uh, jelly bean thing. So a cup has two red jelly beans and two blue. If the second draw came, uh, came out blue, what was the first 
what was the probability, what is the probability, sir? What is probability of the first row being red? Oh, oh, I shouldn't say this. What's the probability of the first row, uh, row being red if we know that second row is blue? So it's like, uh, maybe this is like a game where uh, players pick random jelly beans from the cup and then uh, the first person goes and picks a jelly bean and right? doesn't show it to anybody, right? And the second person goes and draws a jelly bean and he finds that it's blue. And you want to know the probability that the other person who came first picked a red. Or, yeah, that, that's basically the idea, right? Okay. Uh, so, you, you really have to imagine this to, to, to think about what's happening because it's, it's a, very important, a very interesting kind of situation. Uh, if you just simply ask, what's the probability of drawing a red in the first row, what is it? Two out, Two out of four. Okay. Now, if the second row is a blue, right, would it be more than a half to that the first guy picked a red or more than, uh, uh, less than half? What do you think? More than a half. Why do you think so? Because there's because less red. Huh? There's less red and more blue. Right. So, so you can kind of, like, roughly this is there. You can say, oh, the reason I picked the blue, uh, if it was the case that the first guy picked the blue, then I only have a one-third probability of getting a blue in the second draw. So. It's, that's not so likely. So it's probably the other case when the first guy picked the red so that I, I have more chance of picking a blue, right? Okay. So here's, here's how, how you think about it. Okay. Uh, right. Think about the probability of x1 being red and x2 being blue. But earlier on, I've already explained that this, what was this value, do you remember? It was uh, one third, right? It was one third. Okay, uh, but the way we calculate it is like this. Probability that you would pick red in the first row times probability that you get the blue in the second row, knowing, knowing that the first was red, okay? But we can change this, like, <coughs> who says I should always put place this one here? I could, like, see, this should be same as probability of x2 being blue and x1 being red, right? It's, whether you say, whether you describe the situation as Oh, we have a situation where the first row was a red and second row is a blue. It's the same thing as saying, oh, we have a situation where we have the second drawing as a blue and the first one was red. It's the same thing, right? So when you have an AND, the AND operator, see, see when I put a comma, that really is an AND. Yeah. So when you have an AND operator, they commute. You agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ANDs commute. So you can see this, and then if I apply the, this, this product rule uh, rule of multiplication to this one, this would be probability of x2 being blue and probability of x1 being red under the condition that x2 two is blue. Hmm. Okay. Now, Then we have this identity where probability of x1 being red, probability of, ah, uh, oh, let's <coughs> simplify things a little bit, okay? Um, so let's say x1 being red is A, okay? And then x2 being blue is B. Okay, so 
the first one reads like P of A times P of B under the fact that A happened. And the second one reads like, can, can you rewrite this using A and B? Yeah, B, P, of B, of B, B B times P of, P of A, A under, under B. B. Okay, so they're the same, right? And then, see, we want to know this, isn't that right? Yeah. That's what we want. So what do we do? We divide both sides by P of B. And then here, here we have a, a nice formula, which is called the Bayes theorem, which says if you want to know the probability that A would happen under the condition B, you multiply P A, P B A, so that this is really P A and B divided by P of B. Now, let's actually use this formula to answer this question. What is P of A? Well, we, we already got the top part. What was this one? It was one third. Now, what's the bottom part? What's the probability that X2 is blue? X2 is blue. With, no, no, without knowing what happened in the first. Two over four. Two over four, right? Uh, so, okay, this... So I'll, I'll raise that a little bit here, and then explain that part. Probability that B would happen would be uh, probability that A and B would happen, okay, uh, plus probability that not A and B would happen. Do you agree? Uh, it, so A is getting a red on the first one, right? Yeah. So either you've drawn a red in the first or you didn't draw the red in the second. Is that right? <coughs> yeah. That's what we know, right? It's either this or that. Okay. But then, oh, and, and then this, this is not. Sometimes a, a complement is used or, or not A is used. Or sometimes the people write like this, not A. Okay? So if the first one is not blue, what's the probability of getting a, uh, I mean, not blue and getting a blue. Okay? So, uh, and I'm using the addition rule because to get the second one as blue, it's either this scenario or that scenario. Okay? And both are these two are mutually exclusive. You can't have both, right? So you, you, you don't have to subtract P of the intersection of everything. Okay? But now, look. I can apply the, the, the usual rule, uh, the conditional probability. This, this is computed as P of A times P of B under A plus P of not A uh, times P of B under the not A. Is that okay? I don't understand why you did that. Uh, why you separate the intersections? Oh, why, why I write it like this, the first line? No, the second line. Second line, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm writing, how do you... How do you calculate A and B? You use the product rule, right. rule of multiplication. So you, you calculate by P, P of the first probability times the P, P of the second probability under the condition that A happened. Right. So w what is this probability? The probability that you get A would be one half, right? It's the probability of getting a red. Okay. What's the probability of getting a, a blue in the second one? It's two thirds because the first one drawn is A, so now it's two thirds. Okay. Plus, what's the probability of not drawing on A? Uh, Again, two fourths, right? Two. Now, so, so A is drawing red in the first row, but then uh, because there are two red and two blues, uh, there's like it's the okay. Well, well see. This is, this is true in general. 
probability of something not happening is one minus probability of that, that thing happening, right? So if this is one half, this other one would be one minus one half, which will again be one half. Okay? And what's the probability of uh, B happening, getting the second one as blue, if the first one was not a red? One third. It would be. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Oh, it would be one third, right? Because that means uh, not red means that the first one drawn is blue. So now in the cup, you have <coughs> one, one blue left and two red left. So it's one third. Okay. Now let's compute this. If you, uh, well, this is six, six. So you get two out of six plus one out of six. Therefore, this is three out of six, which is one half. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's what I meant by saying, oh, it, it, if you don't know anything of what happened in the first row, probably of getting the blue would be just, just one half. Okay. So, now that we know that the top is one third and the bottom is one half, the probability of that A, A is, uh, A, probably of A under B would be one third divided by one half, which is one third times two over one, which is two thirds. Okay, so that's that's the question, the answer to this question, it's two thirds. Okay, so uh, this this is what Bayes' theorem does. Okay, so to to summarize, uh, this is what Bayes' theorem does. Often you know the probability of something happening and also probably of something happening under some other condition. But sometimes you need to invert that relationship. You want to know the probability of A happening under B. How do you invert something? You use this formula. <laughs> so let me, let me write this down. Uh, apparently the guy's name is Bayes, not Bay. So. The apostrophe comes up here. I was wrong in previous notation. The Bayes' theorem says that if I want P of <coughs> B happening under A, then this by definition is P of B intersect A divided by P of A. That, that was our definition of conditional probability. Now, in, in pictures, this is what happens. Uh, if you have A and B under all the possibility, uh, U, so <coughs> what's the probability of A? A is like, if, if we think about the basketball and football <coughs> example, <coughs> Uh, number of people playing basketball over number of people in the, the school, right? So PA would be the number of people in A divided by number of people in U. And PB would be number of people in B divided by number of people in U. That, that's how you, you calculate it, right? Uh, but then what is P? A or B under A. Let's think about that. B under A. Well, that's like I know that A is now the set, right? And this much is B and A. Right? So, so if, if you know that now we are restricted to A, what's the probability that you're, you'll be here? You, you'll have B. Well, that's like number of people in A and B divided by the number of people in A. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, if you divide the top and bottom by number of people in U, this is what? What is this? It's this. Right? The denominator is number of people in A. What's the top? That's the probability of A and B. Okay? So, if you have this idea, then this formula actually looks quite natural. Okay, so that, 
That's another way to understand this conditional probability, apart from examples. Just have this picture and then it's not obvious. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this around and apply the rule of product, which is you multiply P of A times P of A under B with P, no, sorry. No, no, no. Got it backwards. You want to multiply P of B times P of A under B over P of A. Where the top one here, from, from here to there, this is the rule of product. <coughs> if you want to know what's the probability of B and A happening at the same time, you multiply probability of B times what's the probability of A happening if you know that B happened. Okay. So you apply it to the top, then this identity is the Bayes rule. So now let me give you a nice example. Okay. Uh, there is question. There is a gene. X. Uh, some, I, my lack of knowledge of biology, I, I can't really say which one it is. Usually the names are really crazy, like A1C something, something, right? So if you have such a, a gene, then, then the probability of having uh, name a cancer. Huh? Lung. lung cancer? Okay. So, okay. having a lung cancer. Yeah. <laughs> having a lung cancer. Is. Uh, zero point. Let's put something high. Something like seven. No. <laughs> zero point seven. That's. Okay. 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 Uh, people without gene X uh, have probability of 0 0.05, let's say 5%. I don't know the exact numbers, I'm just pulling these numbers. Uh, of having Okay. Now, let's say about uh, three percent of U.S. population, U.S. population, have gene X. Now here's the question. What is the prob uh, if if a patient is diagnosed with lung cancer? What is the probability? of that patient having gene X. So in other words, this, this is same as asking how many lung cancer patients, like what percentage of the lung cancer patients have this gene X? That will be the question, right? Agreed? Okay, and that's an in interesting medical question because uh, maybe the the treatment is different for people with Gene X and without Gene X. 
very likely, right? Uh, because now, nowadays uh, uh, there are gene-targeted therapy where they try to uh, make those genes not express uh, their traits. So having, having an answer to such a thing would be very beneficial for the medical field. Okay, so how are you going to answer this? And this is a, a typical kind of question that's answered using uh, Bayes' theorem, which is uh, you, if you know that uh, something happens with some probability under, that con under another condition, what's the probability where you switch them? Okay. That's how you do it. Yeah. All right. So we're going to work with two events. Uh, X will be the gene, gene X, and then L will be the having the lung cancer, okay? All right, so let's try to encode this. Uh, there's a gene X that, uh, ah, this doesn't read well. If, if a person, has uh, the gene X, then the probably having lung cancer is 0.7. Okay. So how, how do you write this? P of what? what? Uh, P of L equals 0 0.05. No. no. The, this first, first sentence. No. P of X. L under what condition? On X. Huh? X. P of L under X is 0 0.7. Okay? All right. Uh, people without gene X have a probability of 0 0.05 having a lung cancer. How do you write that? Uh, P of X not. P of not X. having a lung cancer oh, 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 under the condition that X is not happening, right? This is 0 0.05, okay? Now let's think about this one. 3% of U.S. population have gene X. What is it? P of X under United States. P of X, well, you don't have to say United States. We'll just say uh, United States, the it's, it's, it's given. So P of X is 0 0.03. Okay. So these are the probability is given until here. Right? Now what's the question asking? We're asking for P of, P of X. X under P of X under P of L. 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 If somebody has lung cancer, what's the probability that they have gene X? That's the question. Okay. And this captures, these capture everything in this, the question. Do you agree? Everything written here is given by that. Okay. All right. So now let's try to compute this using the Bayes theorem. So P of X under L is equal <coughs> to, uh, remember, the Bayes theorem allows you to flip these two, right? So if I want this, in the formula, you would have it flipped. So what's that? This would be L under X, which is quite good, right? But then what would multiply to this one? It would multiply to PX. So in my mind, it's like these two cancel, and then you end up with the intersection of both. So this, this top here, here is really this top one here, in my mind, is really P of X and L happening, right? And then uh, we know that the conditional probability is the P of something and something divided by the, the, this denominator. So, so in my mind, this, this bar is like division. It, it's under, so P of L. Okay, so now let's think about the following. Uh, are we, do we know P of X? Yes. Yes, we do. Do we know P of L under X? Yes. 
We do, right? Do we know P of L? No. no. Unfortunately, no. And this is the usual challenge of the Bayes theorem. This, I'm, I'm saying something really important. Anytime you try to use the Bayes theorem, it's always this denominator that causes the problem. Uh, it, even in uh, practical purposes, Bayes uh, theory is used in many places because it can answer so many of these questions. What ha what's the probability uh, of this thing happening if we know these, these things? Uh, but in all of these case, cases, always this denominator is the one that causes the most trouble. <coughs> now this one, <coughs> we can calculate by saying P of L is either P of L with X or P of X P of L without X. Right? If a person has a lung cancer, this person is either the person with gene X or without gene X. We know that, right? And this covers all of those cases, so it should be right. And then <coughs> these two are mutually exclusive. You can't have have gene X and not have gene X at the same time. So it's mutually exclusive, so you don't have to subtract the intersection. And then uh, how do you calculate this? Well, you could say this is PL times P X under L, but then that means you have to know what PL is. So instead of that, you write down P of X times P of L under X plus P of what? Not X and P of L under not X. Okay. What's P of X? 0 0.03. What's P of LX? 0 0.7. Right, I'm just quoting from up there. Okay. Plus, what's P of not X? 0 0.97. 9, 0.97, because it's 1 minus this. Okay, so 0 0.97. What's P of L not X? 0.05. 0 0.05. Okay. So we have this. Uh, can somebody help me out here? What, what's this value? It's uh, 0 0.021 plus... Uh, what is this? Point zero four eight five. Yeah, zero point zero eight five. Four eight five. Four eight five. Oh, okay, okay. four eight five. <coughs> okay, and therefore this is going to be zero point zero uh, six nine five. Okay, so we're almost there. So this is going to be. P of X is 0 0.03, P of L under X is 0 0.7, divided by 0 0.0695. Okay. Somebody help me out here. What do you get? Uh, 0.30. That's it? Uh, Two one two one. Okay. All right. So that's it. That's how you use the base theorem. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Now I'm ready to talk about naive Bayesian. I guess I wouldn't have time to do demonstration today. So yeah, this took me longer than I thought. Yeah, the, the problem is that this course assumes that you've taken s statistics and you've learned your probability, but like from the first few, few lessons, I, I realized that you guys really didn't learn much in the statistics. So things like conditional probability is so, something that, that everyone here should, should know. The, the rule of products, again, is the same uh, thing that everyone should know, but then <coughs> if I assume that people know and then I start explaining that nobody is going to understand anything, so yeah, unfortunately I, I will end up having to explain a little bit more than what usually should be covered. Well, hopefully until now it, it, it all made sense, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it made sense? Okay. All right, so now I'm going to talk about naive case.
<clears throat> so, uh, let, we're going to do uh, spam filters. So, uh, in the early days, spam, when, when uh, people were getting spams, uh, <coughs> engineers had to quickly make some spam filters, right? Uh, nowadays, it's more uh, elaborate. Uh, uh, I guess the machines actually can uh, interpret some some words and figure out with more accuracy whether one is a spam or not. But uh, uh, in the early days, it was just naive bays that people would use. Okay. So let's think about uh, the following question. Okay. Question is if x1, x2, da da da, xn. So think about these word sets. Like uh, if the word email contains million dollars, that's probably spam, right? Okay. And then if, if uh, the email also contains Nigerian princess, then or prince or something, that's that's probably a spam, right? So uh, <coughs> you you have some choice of words, okay? And uh, th these are whether x1 is like whether <coughs> the word million appears or not, okay? And x2 is whether dollars appear or not, and so on and so on, okay? So those are the events, okay? And <coughs> now the question is, what's the probability of some, some email being a spam if you know that X1 is true, yeah, you do see million, and then you do see dollars. You don't see princess anywhere, so I think this could be false, and so on, right? So that's the question. That, that's the question that we're trying to answer. If you have an email and you have a list of words, and then uh, you, you look at various uh, whether the word is present or not, is this a spam or not? That, that's the problem, probably. But then, you see that this is a conditional probability, right? So, what we have is, uh, this would be under the Bayes theorem, this would be probability of, uh, so first of all, these should be switched around, right? Switched around, so it's a probability of x1 being true. I'll just put x1, x2. Or, or you know what? Uh, I, wrote, I wrote capital for, for random variables. They, they go by capital letters. But if I use uh, small, small letters, uh, x1, that's like, uh, if x1 is true, that's like x1, small x1 is 1 or 0 or something. This would be like 1. Uh, so the, these are, lower cases are actual values, okay, so let's say x1 would be 1 if it's true, uh, x1 would be 0 if it's false, okay. So if you do that, then uh, the, so let me rewrite this. So, so in other words, I want P of S under x1, x2, da, 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 xn. But using the Bayesian theorem, uh, Bayes theorem, that we, we see that you can invert this relationship. So you have P of x1, x2, da, 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 xn under s. Okay? And then, uh, as I said, uh, what should be multiplied here? Well, this is in the denominator, so you want to cancel it, right? Okay. So this would be P of S. Okay. And then divide it by, well, this is this over that, right? Or, or the intersection of this and this over, or, or this. So in the Bayes theorem, this, this goes in the denominator, P of observing serving this. 
Okay. Now, this one is not so hard to get. It's just a percentage of spam mails you usually get. Okay? If you get 1,000 mails, uh, you know, the, the spam data I sent out via email, that one has like less spam than, than ham. You, you know what ham is? Ham is the, the not spam. So the regular mails are called, emails are called ham. And the spams are the ones that you want. Okay? Uh, so uh, probably of the, the spam would simply be the, the percentage of spam in your email. Okay? Nowadays, it's like, what, 90% of your email is spam and then 10% is not. But in those days, uh, in the old days, it was like something like 30% spam and 70% ham. Okay? So this will be like 0.3. That won't be hard to do. <coughs> what about this one? Well, for this one, uh, you just have to look at all the spam mails and see what's the likelihood of getting such a thing. Okay? Uh, and then this one, you just figure out by counting all the possible occurrences. Right? Uh, but see, when you're trying to do classifiers, we're not really interested in the value of this P. Rather, we, we, all, all we want to do is whether this is bigger than the probability of not being a spam. Okay. And then if I apply the same rule with not S, And then, then uh, the way we are going to classify an email as a spam or not is if this value is bigger than this, then spam. it's spam. If this value is bigger than this, ham. That, that's basically the idea. But then look at this. They have the same denominator, right? So that means you only need to know the top and top. Okay? Yeah. So the... There are two ideas of the naive base. So idea one, this is where the naive comes from. Naive is that P of x1, xn under S is same as probability of x1 under S times probability of x2 under S, da da da, P of xn under S. Same with the other one, uh, P of x1, da, 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 xn, not s would be probability of x1, not s, da, 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 until probability of xn under not s. So uh, what am I doing here? I'm just saying that this probability is simply product of these things. Uh, and this simple kind of product only works when these events are what? Independent. So you, you have this naive independence assumption, which is not really true. If you see million, it's likely that you're going to see dollars more than usual. Okay? If, you, uh, if you see uh, prince or princess, it's likely that you're going to see Nigeria, at least in the uh, old days. Nowadays, they, they change it to Egypt or whatever. But uh, it, it's, there is some correlation between the, the occurrences so that these are not independent. But you just treat it like this. So you, you can kind of imagine this uh, in the 90s that when spam were like prevalent and some engineer is looking at this and say, hey, just, let's just calculate it like that. They don't really care about mathematical accuracy. Let's just, just do that, okay? So that's where the naive comes from, okay? And idea two is that all we need is this divided by that. Okay? If this divided by that is bigger than 1, spam. Okay? If this divided by this is less than 1, ham. Right? If, 
If this divided by this is bigger than 1, that means the numerator is bigger than the denominator, right? Because they're both positive. So that there's more probability that it's a span rather than hand. That's the idea, OK? So uh, what we do over here is to say that to use use p of s under x1 xn divided by p of et not s under xn, which is uh, which is going to be well, if you, I raised it, but the denominators will cancel each other, right? And you're going to get P of S, and then if I use that, it's P of X1, S, until P of Xn, S, divided by P of not S, P of X1 under not S, just like that, okay? So, uh, use this. If this is bigger than 1 or less than 1, that, that's the criteria, okay? But there's one more. Idea 3, <coughs> take log. Now, so in other words, what you're doing is you're taking the log of probability of s under something divided by probability of not s under something. You're taking this. Uh, now, why, why do that? This is purely, this is not math, this is purely computer science. See, in computer science, 0, 0.000 with, say, uh, 100 zeros and then 1, that's considered as 0. Uh, it depends on the, the size of the floating point, uh, but uh, there are various ways to store decimal numbers. But if it's cl too close to zero, there's no way to distinguish between uh, 10 to the negative 1,000 and zero. But see, your list of words are so many. If you, if you collect all the possible numbers in the data set that you have, uh, you basically have like half the dictionary in there, maybe. Okay? Or maybe that's too exaggerated, but you, you have so many. And all of these will, will be, a lot of them will, will occur with like 0 0.01 probability. So if you multiply them, you end up with a very, very small number. The problem with that is if you do that and if you store it to, to the float, it's going to say 0. And then you end up with 0 divided by 0 error. So you can't do anything. Uh, that's where the log comes from. Why does log work? Because if you take the logs, these become additions. And these become, see, log with 10 to the negative 100, right, is just negative 100 times, uh, let's say, ln of 10. Yeah. I don't know the exact value of this, but it's, it's a negative value. Yeah. You can easily add these numbers without any problem. So that's where the log comes from. And What's log of 1? 0. So if it's exactly 1, if this thing is 1, then you get 0. So if this is positive, then it's a span. If it's negative, then it's a hand. So that, that's basically the idea of the 